everybody, welcome to Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Tonight we're going to be talking all about sleep. So if you struggle with sleep, falling asleep, staying asleep, getting a good night's sleep, um, this is the show for you. We're going to be doing a deep dive on the topic. As always, if you've got questions specific to the show tonight, try to put those in now. I'll do my best to get them answered for you. And uh, let's dive in. So we're going to be talking about sleep, including uh, a little bit about gluten and how gluten in, in impacts sleep. And I think it's a good to start the conversation with that because so many of you are gluten sensitive. And it's one of those areas where doctors very frequently, when somebody's gluten sensitive, they don't associate gluten with sleep problems. Um, generally, and really this, this whole field of medicine, in my, in, in my opinion, and in my experience, it's really, it's really kind of backwards because when you have sleep trouble, what do they want to do? Usually they want to do a sleep study, right? So to do a sleep study, most of the time, not all the time, they take you into a strange building with a room full of strangers who want to watch you and monitor you as you sleep. Now, I don't know about you, but you know the best way to get a good night's sleep is not in a strange place with a bunch of strangers um, ramping up your anxiety before you try to go to sleep to then measure and monitor how well you sleep. It's, it's backwards, right? Now, some doctors have gone to the kind of the take home sleep monitors, but you have to put this big web net on your head and, it, and it's very obtrusive to good sleep. And so a lot of the studying that doctors do don't really help you evaluate why you're not sleeping. They, they Generally, they want to come to terms as whether or not you have something called sleep apnea or insomnia, and, and if you have sleep apnea, they're gonna prescribe you a home CPAP machine, and a CPAP machine is gonna force air into your mouth, or into, not in your mouth, but into your, in, up through your nose and into your, into your body, um, because either your airways are too restrictive, or your, your sinuses are too congested, um, or, you're, or you're not breathing, you're stopping your breathing when you're going to sleep at night. And so that doesn't really resolve why you're not sleeping, right? It's a, so a lot of the measures to evaluate sleep are, are in my opinion, they're, they're archaically crazy uh, and not very helpful. And a lot of the measures to improve sleep are rather obtrusive um, and not very helpful either because the reality is most people have a reason why they're not sleeping and it's not generally because they have a deficiency of a CPAP machine that they can take home, and it's not because they have a deficiency of clonazepam or any other anti-anxiety medication or any other very high-powered sleeping medication that overrides your body's uh, alert systems and puts you into a state, in my opinion, where it induces sleep where, where it shouldn't, right? Because your body is not letting you sleep, and there's a reason why your body is smarter than the drugs, and if you override your body's messaging with drugs, you're going to end up in trouble and you're not going to end up in a good place. So all that being said, let's talk about gluten a little bit as it relates to sleep. Now, there have been studies on gluten. We'll pull that up. We'll pull that up first. So there have been some studies. This is just one I wanted to show you tonight. There's more than this. And by the way, if you guys want to get show notes, in essence, everything that we're talking about, all the graphics, all the images, all the research studies, all the links to the studies to read them yourself, Come over to glutenfreesociety.org. Make sure you, you sign up for our newsletter. Um, we send those out. We send those detail-oriented drafts for you every week after the show. So if you want to get access to all this information and that you can see these images and pictures more clearly, um, come subscribe to my newsletter and we'll make sure you get that. So this was a study on the effect of a gluten-free diet on sleep disturbances in children with celiac disease. And what you can see here, and this study was done on 103 kids. Um, a significant improvement in sleep scores was detected after starting a gluten-free diet, meaning that going gluten-free led to improvements in sleep, regardless of their age, their sex, or their symptom status. With a gluten-free diet, children may fall asleep more easily and sleep for longer with less interruptions. Gluten-free diets may help to reduce sleep disturbances. Um, in essence, a gluten-free diet is very helpful. So when we ask the question, well, why do people with gluten sensitivity and celiac disease have trouble sleeping? What is that, what is that mechanism at work? And there are a lot of different mechanisms at work. I'm sharing a few of them with you tonight. There certainly are more than these. But some of the things have to do with what gluten causes. So in some people, gluten affects the brain and actually can trigger neurological anxiety. Brain inflammation, otherwise known as brain inflammation, 
where gluten actually can trigger an inflammatory response in the brain leading to heightened anxiety and trouble sleeping. Because what happens when we're anxious is we release chemicals like adrenaline and noradrenaline and cortisol, right? And these are hormones of stress. This is why we're experiencing anxiety, right? We're producing the hormones of stress. And when we produce the hormones of stress, it's a feed forward cycle, right? Anxiety causes increased cortisol. Cortisol elevation causes increased anxiety. So we have to find out what's causing the anxiety. Well, for many of the people, it's eating food that their body perceives to be a threat and it creates an inflammatory response driving this. So it's one of the reasons why for many people, especially those of you who, who had neurological manifestations of gluten exposure, like anxiety or bipolar disease or ADD, again, neurological manifestations driving anxiety, going gluten-free helps that and therefore has an impact on sleep. Another common one that we see that gluten causes is acid reflux. And you know, this is especially true when it comes to the positioning of the body when you're trying to lie down and go to sleep at night. So a lot of times people with persistent acid reflux or really even acid reflux might not even be an accurate term in regards to more specifically GI or stomach lining irritation. So, because a lot of times it's not really regurgitation of acid so much as it is the stomach lining is inflamed and irritated and that feels a lot like what people think is acid reflux and then it gets misdiagnosed you go to the doctor they say it's acid reflux give you an antacid right and then that doesn't really resolve the problem but the stomach lining itself is irritated and so when you lie down um, when you lie down at night to try to go to sleep, there's pain there. There's real pain, there's real pressure, and that can interfere with you being able to calm down and relax and be able to get into a sleep situation. So this, the pain, right, of that irritation. Then there's also physical pain manifestations in the muscles and in the nerves, and then also in the joints. So there's diseases like rheumatological disease, rheumatoid arthritis, um, neuropathies, um, different types of myopathies where the muscle itself becomes inflamed. So nerve, muscle, and joint inflammation, we know gluten can cause all three. And so pain is one of the big causes of an inability to fall asleep. And you get this all the time. People come to see me, they're in a lot of pain and their sleep is disrupted. And because their sleep is disrupted, they can't heal from the pain. I'm going to short, I'm going to kind of shrink this down because I want to draw your attention to, you know, a, a kind of a cycle, if you will. So you got, you need sleep in order to heal and repair. And without sleep, you don't repair. And this is when we do this, we do this at night. So our body heals, repairs itself at night. And so we need to repair so that we can recycle cells to continue to function, right? In order to function, what does function mean? Function is to continue to function in the world, right? Your muscles and your nerves and your skin and your bone, all of the cells in your body need this repair work because Cells can be damaged. There are a number of things in the environment can, can damage cells. Radiation, gluten, as we're talking about right now, is one of those things. Other people have food allergies that are related to that damage. Some people are exposed to chemical toxins related to that damage. So you need that repair work, right? And that to recycle cells and to heal and repair the functionality so, so that you can have functionality of your cells. Because what happens if you don't have this, if you don't have repair, is you end up losing function. But not just that, right? You actually lose the ability to heal. So really losing the ability to heal comes first. So you, you, this would be one and then this would be two. So because when you're not sleeping, you're not healing, you're not repairing. And when you're not repairing your cells and your tissues become more and more damaged over time, they age more quickly and they start to lose their ability to function. And then you feel older and you can't heal again, you can't repair. And so when you're eating something like gluten, it's creating a vicious cycle where you are in chronic pain 
and it's disrupting your sleep, the pain that's being caused by the damage from the gluten won't heal if you don't quit eating gluten, but it really also won't heal if you are still in pain and you're not able to sleep. So it creates this vicious cycle where sleep is constantly disrupted. Another example of a gluten-induced condition is eczema and other skin rashes like psoriasis. These things create severity of itching on the skin, right? They're, you know, I, I sometimes get kids, parents bring their kids to me, and the child's got eczema head to toe, and all night long, what are they doing? They're scratching their skin. They can't fall asleep because they're just incessantly itching. Skin is oozing and weeping sores, right? And so a lot of times I, I got parents that duct tape gloves or mitts on their children's hand to prevent them from scratching. You think about that, it's miserable existence. Diet change for many, right? For many, diet change is the answer here because if these things go away, if, and these are just, again, this is just a, a list of examples of gluten-induced symptoms that can disrupt sleep as a result of how it makes you feel, right? Then a diet change is pretty simple. And then there's another one, which is gluten-induced nutritional deficiencies. And we'll talk about this uh, a little bit later, but there are a number of different nutrients that are required for you to go to sleep, okay? The nutrients that are required for you to be able to make melatonin and serotonin and other neurotransmitters that are calming and relaxing. There are nutrients that are required to, to help regulate blood sugar and cortisol so that when you do go to sleep, you can stay asleep. And so gluten-induced nutritional deficiencies is a very, very common side effect of long-term gluten exposure due to the GI damage. And so a lot of people struggle here. And even if you're not gluten sensitive, nutritional deficiencies can be a major, major cause of sleep disturbance and sleep disruption. Okay, so that's just, a, again, a crash course on some of the ways that gluten can, can affect you. So let's talk a little bit about how to improve sleep naturally. And so I've, what I've got here is a list, and there are things that we're going to add to this. But um, what I want you to walk away with tonight are some actionable things that you can begin implementing immediately that can have profound impact on how well your body is capable of falling asleep, staying asleep, and actually getting good, deep, restful sleep. And so one of the things that in this world, in this day and age today, that people ignore um, because of their lifestyle, right? Or maybe they don't ignore it, but, but they don't address it effectively as sunshine exposure. Now, one of the things about sunshine is when light hits your eyes, that allows you to start producing melatonin. Now, melatonin, we want it throughout the course of the day, melatonin slowly increases, right? And then when we get to night, we, have, we should have enough melatonin, right, that it helps us fall asleep. Melatonin, we don't make it as well or efficiently if we're not getting direct sun exposure. And this exposure that needs to happen here is this exposure needs to happen on the eyes. We need the exposure on the eyes. How many of you wear sunglasses when you go outside? What you're basically doing is, is, is in an effort uh, to protect your eyes from what most doctors would say sun solar damage um, which most of that's nonsense. Um, you're blocking your body's ability to actually generate melatonin when you're wearing those. So we want that sunshine exposure. That doesn't mean you look directly into the sun and burn your retina, but it does mean that take the sunglasses off and let some natural light in. Your body's designed to work in the world. It's not designed that you need to have all this gear and all this accessories in order to function in the world. And so sunshine exposure has got to be on your number one list of things to do. Now, some of you may go to work early in the dark, right? And, you know, some times of the year, especially winter months, you're leaving to go to work and you're commuting to go to work in the dark. And then by the time you get home, it's already dark. And so in those situations, you've got to find time in your day to get outside. And so maybe that's eat your lunch outside. Maybe that's go for a, a, a walk at lunch. But do something every day to get that daily sunshine exposure. The other issue is most of you probably spend way too much time indoors, don't get outside enough, you know, whether it's computers or personal devices. And so the light that you're actually getting is not the sunshine exposure, it's this blue light from screens, this artificial blue light from screens, and that is hugely disruptive of your sleep. And a lot of times too, that blue light comes at night. You know, either when maybe you're watching TV or, you know, you're, you're We'll just label it PD, your personal devices, whether it's a cell phone or some type of pad of some sort, right? But you're getting that mega blue light exposure 
right before you're supposed to go to bed. So basically what you're doing is you're telling your eyes it's daytime, right, when it's supposed to be nighttime and you're completely throwing your circadian rhythm, rhythm off. And it's important that you minimize any blue lights before bedtime. It's important that you get plenty of sunshine throughout the course of your day. Now another one that affects you know, that affects people's sleep is stress management. Now, sometimes you can control the stress in your life and other times you can't, right? Sometimes life throws curveballs. The last two years, most people's lives have been a hellacious curveball, um, this pleasant, you know, no matter what your beliefs are. And, and that has been very, very stressful. The world is stressed out right now. But we have to, you know, we have to think about it like this. Pray about the things you can't control and control the things that you know to control. And that's the best way to manage your stress. So stress management, a big part of stress management is doing everything else on this list because what is stress? Stress comes in three primary flavors. It comes in, in the form of physical stress, in the form of emotional stress, and in the form of chemical stress. So most of you know what emotional stress is, right? You hang out with the wrong people maybe, or you have bad relationships, or you go to a job you hate. Um, it all can be very stressful. There, certainly there are life stressors in relationships that are emotional. But then there's physical stress, which is either you, you sit too much, so there's a lack of physical stress. Remember, we need some physical stress. It's not always too much stress. Sometimes it's an absence of stress in the right place. So physical stress is important, but overtraining and too much physical stress can actually disrupt you as well. And then there's, there's physical stress and then there's chemical stress. And chemical stress has to do with what you eat, it, and so think of it as what you put in your body. The things that your body's exposed to, whether it's food, drugs, whether it's air, light, those kinds of things are biological, chemical stressors. Again, good or bad, we need some uh, good stressors, but managing them. So if you're not drinking enough, if you're not exercising well, if you have a poor diet, right? If you're loading up on caffeine for energy, these are all forms of stress that you're contributing to, and so that's bad stress management. So when we talk about stress management, we're really talking about everything else on the list. And if you're doing all those other things well, then you're managing your stress well. And sometimes life keeps us awake at night because we need to be stressed, because there's something we need to resolve. And so remember, it's not about perfection. It's not about, um, although you shouldn't be going months at a time without sleep, sometimes life throws that curveball your brain has to process it, and it may disrupt your sleep for a few nights. That's not something you want to medicate. That's not something you want to pop you know, NyQuil over or, or take heavy drugs uh, because your brain, when it's trying to process, when it's trying to deal with something, you've got to give it that opportunity. And sometimes that opportunity is when you're lying down in bed at night. Good hydration. Good hydration is very, very important for stress. The electrolytes, a lot of times if you're cramping, one of the biggest signs of bad hydration is cramping. And a lot of people, this happens to a lot of people at night, especially those of you as you get older than 35, that nighttime cramping in the feet. This is a, a hallmark, a hallmark of electrolyte. Oftentimes is a hydration issue, partly because many of you are over caffeinating. Caffeine's a diuretic. Some of you are over-alcoholing. Alcohol is also a diuretic. And some of you are just not drinking adequate fluid. And so you don't have great hydration, great electrolytes, and your feet start to cramp when you're lying in bed at night. You gotta jump out of bed and stretch them so that they're not cramping, waking you up. And so this is, again, good hydration is very important. Now, if your feet cramp at night, one of the best things you can take for that is a mixture of calcium and magnesium. You know, but but even with this, this may not be the full fix, although sometimes calcium and magnesium deficiencies cause cramping, which can disrupt sleep. Poor hydration can do it too, but aggressive stimulant use will cause calcium and magnesium loss. And then we have exercise, because this is especially true of women. Um, and I hope none of you take this the wrong way, ladies, but women are cerebral creatures. And that means that a lot of their energy is spent in the brain. It's spent in the mind, you know, milling over how to solve something maybe going on in their life, right? They process and they process and they process. It's one of the differences between men and women. Women hyper-process mentally. Men tend not to process mentally enough. Uh, so, so however you want to take that, guys. But Women do it, can do it to such a point 
that that hyper-processing drives stress and disrupts their sleep. And so one of, for women, one of the most effective ways to improve sleep is through exercise. Because what that does is it will burn through some of that energy that you're using cerebrally. There will be less energy cerebrally because you're using it physically. And so this is a, a hallmark. I see it all the time in females who don't exercise is they, they really struggle with a lack of sleep. And once we put them on an exercise program, they're, they're out, they're out. They're out like a baby, 9, a, 9 p.m. They're just, boom, they hit their head, hits the pillow. One of the things I hear a lot too from women is, my husband's head hits the pillow and he's asleep, you know, before his, his neck is even relaxed. And I'm sitting there for an hour and a half or two hours and my mind is just spinning and churning and spinning. Ladies, you got to incorporate exercise if you're not. Now, maybe you are and you're still struggling. Look at, let's look at some of these other things. Sleep hygiene strategies. What does that look like? A sleep hygiene strategy is, you know, focusing on when it's bedtime, not being busy and not thinking about things that are going to stimulate your mind into a stressful situation. If you get in bed and you think about stressful things, and if you have a stressful conversation with your spouse as you're lying in bed, you're going to disrupt your ability to fall asleep. Because if you stress yourself out right before bed, you're going to, all the hormones of stress, right? The adrenaline, the cortisol, you're now pumping those out. Well, we don't want those when it's bedtime. We want our cortisol to be super low. We want our adrenaline to be super low as well. So sleep hygiene is, you know, having calm and peaceful thoughts before bedtime and not engaging in that thing you wanted to talk to your husband or wife about, um, nighttime is not the time to have that conversation. You know, pick a different time where you can come together and don't create that stress right before bed. Now, some people with type A personalities do really, really well journaling before they go to bed. And, and there are a number of different things you can do with journaling. Now, it's not like a diary where you write down all your, your daily events so much, but what some people find very helpful is they journal their to-dos. So if you've got a list of things that you need to do tomorrow and your mind is just going through those and you're thinking about those and your mind is focused on those and it's, you're supposed to be sleeping, a lot of times writing those things down in a notepad next to your bed allows your mind to let go of those ideas so that your mind can get into a sleep mode. So some people do really well by journaling their to-dos um, that right before you go to bed, right before you, that way again, you can let your mind quit thinking about those things. Other sleep hygiene strategies would include turning off your EMF, turning off your, your any kind of blue light exposure that you might have, making sure that the temperature is comfortable in your bedroom. So setting that thermostat to a comfortable temperature that allows you to feel at peace in your bed, right? And so a lot of times uh, it's cooler at night. Think of your, your thermostat as being set cooler at night because what's about to happen is your body's about to heat up as it's healing, as it's repairing. Your metabolism is about to speed up and you're going to get hot under those covers. So a lot of people sleep really, really well between 70 and 72 degrees Fahrenheit. And so if you're setting your thermostat higher, then that might be disruptive of your sleep as well. So those are just some hygiene strategies to think about before getting in bed. Then we got diet, and one of the mistakes people make right before bed is they eat a big amount of food, and if they're having any kind of GI problems, you know, that can be irritative. Now, on the contrary, you might eat a meal and find that all the blood leaves your head and goes to your gut, and you're like out like a baby because your digestion is good. So, you know, this diet could go either way, either eating before bed might be helpful or eating not eating anywhere near bed, depending on what your history is with your stomach and your GI tract. But um, it's, it's a smart thing to know where you stand there and just abide by how your body responds. Um, reducing caffeine and other stimulants. So don't drink coffee before you go to bed. A lot of people have like an evening cup of coffee. Bad idea. I mean, caffeine's a stimulant. It's gonna, it's gonna shoot up your adrenaline. It's gonna make it really hard for you to sleep. Um, alcohol is another one that really can be disruptive of your sleep. It can, it can, what alcohol does, it makes you sleepy in the moment, but causes you to wake up in the middle of the night. So you really want to, if you're tr struggling with sleep, especially if you're waking up in the middle of the night and you're drinking that glass of wine at dinner every night, that may be part of your problem. A lot of people want to relax with that wine, 
but then it, they end up waking up sometime at two or three in the morning uh, in a deeper sweat as their body tries to detoxify that alcohol. So be careful around alcohol. Other stimulants would be things like chocolate. You know, obviously you don't want to eat a bunch of chocolate before bedtime. Chocolate has caffeine in it as well. So any, anything, tea, coffee, chocolate, anything higher in caffeine, you really want to look at trying to eliminate right before you go to bed. Now, something else you can do, you know, we talk about diet and what you can and what you shouldn't eat, but some foods you can consume that are higher in tryptophan and melatonin can help improve your sleep if you eat an hour or so before bedtime. We'll come to those in just a minute. And then I also mentioned a cooler room temperature, making sure the temperature, whether it's cooler or not, um, making sure it's comfortable for you. And sometimes, you know, with spouses, you, you guys may disagree. So you've got to figure that one out and come to some type of negotiation so that you can both sleep as well. But these are all strategies that you could do right now. You could implement tonight and you could um, make yourself feel a lot better if you're struggling here. Let's talk a little bit next about some nutrition deficiencies that can disrupt quality of sleep. Probably number one on the list is magnesium. Magnesium is mother nature's natural muscle relaxer and nervous system calming agent. So a lot of people have magnesium deficiency. And if you're cramping, that's one hallmark symptom. If you're having eyelid twitching in the middle of the day or shoulder muscle twitching or leg muscle twitching, you know, magnesium may be something that you could benefit tremendously from. Now, different kinds of magnesium, one of the best for sleep is a magnesium that can cross the blood-brain barrier. And so there's a specific type of magnesium that does that better than others, and that's called magnesium threonate. I call it brain magnesium because it passes through the blood-brain barrier much easier. It's, mag it's magnesium bound to this carrier called threonate. And, uh, and that, again, it gets it into the brain and that can really induce cal a calming sensation in the brain itself. Now remember, there are things that deplete magnesium and one of the biggest hallmarks that depletes magnesium is stress. The more stress you're under, so going back to stress management, the more stress you have, the more magnesium your body uses. There are other things that will deplete magnesium as well. One of them is steroids. So if you're using steroids for asthma treatment, if you're using steroids for pain, like oral corticosteroids, those induce magnesium deficiency. They can impact your magnesium and subsequently impact your ability to relax, calm down, and go to sleep. Additionally, antacids. So if you're taking medicines for heartburn, antacids are also problematic and can contribute to magnesium deficiency. Um, both over-the-counter antacids as well as prescription antacids can both do it. Um, so very, very important if you're taking certain medications that you're aware of how they might impact your nutrition status, but particularly that magnesium. We also know vitamin D deficiency is very, very common in people with sleep disruption and that supplementing vitamin D can be very, very helpful. And there are a number of reasons why. I think one of the biggest reasons why vitamin D is so helpful is it regulates, and magnesium does this too, by the way, it regulates blood sugar. And so one of the things that people will wake up, um, they'll wake up at night oftentimes because their blood sugar levels drop, right? So if your blood sugar levels drop at night, your body might look at that and perceive that as a problem, right? And so when your body's perceiving a problem like low blood sugar, one of the things it responds by doing is it responds by increasing cortisol. One of the reasons what cortisol is a steroid, right? That we make, it's in our adrenal glands, it's produced by adrenal glands. Cortisol elevates blood sugar. But cortisol is also the hormone that wakes you up, right? In the morning, when the sunlight comes through the window and you're, you wake up naturally, what is that that's doing that? It's the sun. It's the sun as it hits even your closed eyes. It's telling your brain, it's telling your brain to release a signal, uh, typically something called ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone. And that hormone it travels to your adrenal gland and tells you to let cortisol loose. 
then cortisol comes out and it turns your brain on and it wakes you up. So if your blood sugar is low in the middle of the night, you might be pumping out cortisol to bring that up and that cortisol is what will wake you up. And so stable blood sugar is very, very, excuse me, very, very important. That's why diet is so critical. Because if you're low, this is one of the reasons why, again, why magnesium is so helpful. Magnesium regulates blood sugar. Vitamin D regulates blood sugar. Guess what? Zinc regulates blood sugar. Chromium regulates blood sugar. These four nutrients right here are the most critical as it relates to keeping your blood sugar even steven, like nice and smooth as you're trying to sleep where you don't get spikes. And so this is one of the reasons why they're on this list of things that really, really help because most... Most of us that live in culture, um, you know, we'll just, we'll just say in modern society, right, whether you're in the UK or whether you're in Australia or the US or Canada um, or any other industrialized city, you're eating food, right, that is farmed incorrectly, you're living a stressful life, you're, um, you're running and gunning, you probably have some blood sugar function problems, just as a general rule of thumb, and so with those blood sugar function problems comes an elevation in cortisol, elevation in insulin, insulin resistance, and sleep disruption. And so again, these nutrients play one of the biggest roles in regulating uh, how well your body controls blood sugar. And then you have other during the course of the day helps us turn that serotonin into melatonin, but we can't make serotonin without tryptophan. Tryptophan's an amino acid. You probably all uh, heard of this right at Thanksgiving everybody pigs out on turkey and then gets sleepy and wants to take a nap Well, turkey's a food that's really high in tryptophan And so that's one of the one of the reasons why it can be uh, a, a Helpful sleep food right and then vitamin b6 helps with this conversion as does copper as does vitamin c But b6 plays a major major role in that process of tryptophan Helping to get to serotonin and melatonin. So these nutrients are very very important for the regulation of blood sugar and the regulation of the sleep hormones. And so you can have them measured. I, I highly encourage you, if you're struggling with sleep, to ask your doctor to measure those nutrients and also other nutrients as well. Um, let's talk about some foods that you can consume here um, that are high in melatonin and tryptophan that might be helpful you know, and I, I see this a lot. I've actually, I was talking to somebody the other day. It was funny because uh, I was prepping uh, to put this show together for you guys. And, and uh, I was talking to a friend uh, that I work out with. He was like, man, I, I was eating some pistachios the other day at lunch and I got so sleepy. He's like, I had to pass out. I had to go lay down. I had to go take a nap. Pistachios are really high in, in tryptophan melatonin. So very good food source pound for pound to help you sleep. So if you were gonna consider eating something closer to nighttime to help with that, pistachios is a good choice. Tart cherries, another good choice. Pound for pound, these two probably highest. And then you have some other options down here, bananas, fatty fish, mushrooms. Now dairy too, I, I, you know, generally I don't put dairy on the list because so many of you are dairy sensitive. If you're gluten sensitive, you're probably dairy sensitive, but this kind of goes back to that warm glass of milk at night to help with going to sleep is one of the reasons why is that it's high in these, in, these, um, in these chemicals. And then we have foods absolutely you shouldn't consume before bed, chocolate being one of them, alcohol being another, coffee and teas being another. So again, I, I mentioned this earlier, anything that's high in caffeine, remember caffeine's a stimulant, and anything that you take that is a stimulant right before bed is a bad idea. And you could add soda to this list, but you've been watching me for any length of time, none of you should be drinking soda anyway. But there are a lot of sports drinks and other things that are high in caffeine, so not just limited to these beverages. So avoid caffeine before bedtime. Okay, and then we have some of the, my favorite things. If you're, real, if you're doing all of that and you're still struggling, um, these are just some additional things that you can incorporate. I, I will say this, you don't want to incorporate supplements to rely on your body's ability to fall asleep at night indefinitely. Like you don't want this to be the long-term solution. Generally the long-term solution to sleep comes in behavior, comes in behavioral change. And what a lot of people do is they say, oh, I don't have time for exercise, or oh, I, I can't get outside. And they don't do the things that they should be doing. 
And so then they become reliant on these types of things. And you don't want to be reliant on these types of things. Now you can use them and certainly let's say, let's say maybe you've been struggling and you're, and you're chronically inflamed and you've got a problem and um, you know, you're just trying to fall asleep. You're just trying to get some sleep because life could be so much better if you could just string together you know, a week or two weeks of decent sound sleep. And so this is where some of these things can be very, very helpful. Again, in that short-term interim to help you begin break through that cycle of not repairing, of not recovering, right? So we use these things, but we use them judiciously as we change our behaviors, as we change our diet to incorporate the, the right elements so that we're not becoming dependent on any of these things. And so again, these are some of my favorite supplements. Magnesium, probably one of the most effective especially magnesium three and eight. Zinc, very effective. It helps regulate a number of different sleep hormones. If you struggle with kind of a high anxiety mindset when you go to bed at night, GABA, theanine can be very, very helpful. Tryptophan and 5-HTP, 5-hydroxytryptophan can also be very helpful. Now, if you're taking an SSRI, like Paxil or Prozac for anxiety, you know, prescription medicines, you gotta be careful with this. Don't take it without being monitored because you can develop something called hyper serotonin syndrome, which is where you're, you're getting too much serotonin and that can go south too. So you do have to be careful if you're taking those other medicines with tryptophan. And then melatonin, again, short term, where I like to use melatonin is when I'm traveling. So if I'm getting on an airplane and I'm traveling to a time zone that's maybe three hours uh, different from where I live or more, Right, I'm gonna use melatonin in that first day to try to adapt my circadian rhythm to wherever I'm traveling, and that way I reduce the jet lag uh, and I can get a good night's sleep. But that's, so that's one way to use melatonin is when you travel, but you can also use it again. A lot of people get scared of melatonin because they think it's habit forming, and it can be if, you're, if it's your long-term solution, it shouldn't be. Remember, this is for short-term, get your sleep, start to heal, and then you can wean these kinds of things off or back. Valerian also nice, uh, an herbal that can work very, very well to, to kind of calm the body and relax the body, especially if you've got jumpy muscles. Same thing with passion flower, works very similar to valerian in that, in that regard. And a lot of times you'll see formulas that might contain a little of this, a little of that, a little of this, right? These just kind of blended formulas. We've got a couple at Gluten Free Society that we use. But these are all good quality things that can help. Again, they shouldn't be long-term solutions. And then the last one is CBD, cannabidiol. Um, this is one, if you, especially if you've got nervous symptoms uh, where, where you're super, super geared and you have um, high, high anxiety and neuropathies, like, neuro like restless leg syndrome and that. This is where a really good CBD supplement can be very, very effective at helping calm down the nervous system and activate, um, help activate the parasympathetic nervous system to get you in a state where you're able and better able to fall asleep. So these are, again, all options, but these are all short-term. You should be looking for the long-term solution in your behavior change and your diet. One of the things that happens, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about diet because I think it's important part of this conversation because a lot of what I see people do to go to sleep too is they take something called, oh, let me just get a good, different color here. Um, they take something called an antihistamine. And if you take an antihistamine, antihistamines make people sleepy, a lot of people sleepy. One of the reasons why is what is histamine? Histamine is a biogenic amine. Which ultimately means it's a stimulant to the brain. So it stimulates the brain to be alert and awake. And this is, you know, this is where food can be super, super important. Because if you're eating food that you're reacting to, that you're allergic to, and it's driving up your histamine, right, which is a stimulant, now you're trying to go to sleep and you've got all the success of histamine that you've produced and you can't sleep because histamine is very, very powerful. And so then you get 
go over to the store and get you some Benadryl or something like that, and you start popping the antihistamine, and you start sleeping. And I've seen people get addicted to antihistamines because of this very thing. Remember, if you change your diet, it take you a long way toward improving. Now, one of the other main causes that I see of elevations in histamine is mold. People that are in mold oftentimes develop something called mast cell activation syndrome, MCAS. And what basically happening, happening here is the mold is stimulating the immune system to hyperexcrete histamine. So they're making too much histamine. They can't break it down. It gets to be bedtime at night. They can't fall asleep and they can't get sound sleep even if they did because the histamine levels just stay chronically elevated and can't be broken down. And so if, if you've changed your diet already, maybe you're already following, you know, to the T, the no grain, no pain style of diet, right? Phase one, phase two, that you're still really struggling to sleep. You might ask this question right here. Is there a potential possibility that mold is playing a role? Or is there a potential possibility that other environmental poisons that you may be being exposed to are playing a role in driving up your histamine levels? Okay, that just about covers it. Let's dive into your questions. Uh, let's see here. Can poor sleep cause AFib or could it be a dietary issue? Linda wants to know, both. Um, it could be either one. I actually had, it's funny, not, it's, it's not funny, it's scary more than anything. I had a, I had a client, um, just a few weeks ago, her doctors wanted to do ablation surgery on her heart. Basically, they wanted to destroy part of the nervous system in her heart because of AFib. And, you know, she told the cardiologist, she said, look, I, I drank a bunch of coffee before coming in today. I know this is not normal for me. This is happening as a result of, of that. And so, you know, let's not jump the gun. Well, anyway, they really pressured her. They kept telling her she was going to die if she didn't get the ablation. Like, you know, this is unfortunate, but some doctors are that way. They put a ton of pressure on you, even though they're wrong. And in this case, it was a caffeine overload. So, but AFib uh, definitely can, can be a, a, a diet issue. AFib can be um, a number of things. It can be magnesium deficiency. It could be potassium imbalance. It could be calcium. It could be B vitamin deficiency, vitamin B1. And there are a lot of different things that can cause uh, AFib. Remember, the heart is a muscle, and the muscle is under the direction of the nervous system, right? And so any nutrients that can impact the way the nervous system communicates how the heart should beat is going to have the potential to create um, a disruption in that. So... You can't forget that. That's why you can never just ignore the nutrition part. Could walking, I'm sure I understand this question, could walking between two and four be due to histamine or cortisol release? Oh, waking, sorry, I thought it said walking. Could waking between two and four be to, due to histamine or cortisol release? Could be. Um, you know, part of it is how do you feel when you wake at that time of the night? Are you mentally just wide awake, like bright eyed and bushy tailed? Are you alert? Is your heart racing? Um, what's going on when you wake up? That's another cue in. So kind of understanding what's, how you feel when you wake up is sometimes a good insight as to what is triggering, you know, the wake up in and of itself. Uh, let's see here. Why do I wake up between 4 or 5 a.m. being wide awake until I fall asleep again around 6? I then wake up at 8.30. Well, I mean, that's hard to answer that question because there's so many variables and factors as to why you might be having that wake-up time, Dahlia. Um, without a greater degree of history, it's really hard for me to, to shoot at that. Um, you might be hitting a low blood sugar. Um, that, that's a very strong possibility. What about menopause, waking up many times with flash, um, wet to sweating the bone, or wet to the bone? What can we do to have 
a good night's sleep without waking up for that reason. Yeah, that's a good one, Nancy. So one of the best things that you can do if you've got a really severe type of hot flash that's happening is look at, we have a formula called Women's Formula. And uh, we can put a link up for you, but it's a mixture of different things that are, they're called adaptogenic herbs. And a lot of women that have hot flashes, when using these herbs, it dramatically reduces that and allows them to, to, um, to get a good sound night's sleep without you know, waking up soaking wet in their clothes. You also might look at, you know, again, your diet, because I've seen cases where where women were having symptoms of what we what we call menopause but really what was happening was their diet was bad or their thyroid medicine was too strong so there are other things that can contribute to that but i would i would start with if it's just what you think is just menopausal symptoms i would start with with women's formula because it, it it's got a nice blend of of different herbals that can really help balance that out uh let's see here Thyroid issues for years now. Stopped eating wheat, dairy, and sugar. I've suffered insomnia for years now. What can I use to fix my thyroid? So Hazel, I, I'd say, I don't, I, I, you know, I don't know whether or not you're on thyroid medication, but I can just comment to this. Um, I see a lot of times where women in particular who've been diagnosed with hypothyroidism and they're being treated with thyroid hormone and, and there are two scenarios here. One scenario is where they're being treated because they have um, abnormal thyroid hormone numbers, like their doctor's measuring their TSH, their T3, their T4, and they're medicating and checking their dose periodically every three to six months or so. And I've seen other scenarios where doctors just say, we're going to put you on thyroid hormone because your symptoms match that. And even if your blood doesn't show that you need thyroid hormone, we're going to put you on it anyway. And what I see a lot of is when those, when those types come in, usually they're being way over medicated and you check their TSH and their TSH is below 0.5, which it should never be below 0.5. If your TSH is below 0.5, odds are you're being over medicated and you need to talk with your prescribing doctor about adjusting your dose. But that's a very, very common thing to see is especially when people start going gluten-free, sh sugar-free, dairy-free, their thyroid starts working again. And so if they're on medicine, from a prior diagnosis, a lot of times their medicine becomes too strong. And so they actually now start having hot flashes, trouble sleeping, increased anxiety, drier skin, more hair loss. Um, those are some of the symptoms associated with the thyroid medicine being too high. So be cautious with that. Let's see, what causes night sweats? Lots of different things. Um, one, of the, one of the biggest is, is overdose of medications. Another one, alcohol is a big one that causes night sweats. Eating too large of a meal too late in the day can cause you to wake up in sweats. Hormonal disruptions can cause night sweats. Is it, so Dennis wants to know, is it true that women need two hours of sleep more than men per night? Yes and no. I'd say, one, it depends on the woman and it depends on the day of that, that the woman, like, like the level of physical exertion um, that the woman exerts through the course of her day. Um, you know, like, like I would say if a woman was crossfitting and a man was crossfitting, that woman should definitely probably get air on the side of more sleep to heal and repair and recover. As a general rule of thumb, again, this is just a it's just a sex difference between men and women. Men are more physically capable of handling stress. So the more stress a woman gets put under, you know, beyond what is maybe typical, she should increase her sleep to recover from that increase in stress. So again, it's, it's not, I wouldn't say all women need two more hours a night sleep than men. I would say it depends on their lifestyle and what they're doing. Let's see here. Magnesium. So Robbie says magnesium GABA CBD really helped me with sleep. 
But when I take melatonin, it gives me the most crazy dreams ever and makes me feel hungover the next day. Some people will, will get that from melatonin. And, and the same can be true as well of, of magnesium, the magnesium three and eight. I, we call them nin, ninja dreams because what I see happen in a lot of people is they have very vivid dreams. And sometimes those vivid dreams are nightmares and they can be kind of scary. Um, but generally when you dream, that's a good sign. You're getting deeper, more restful sleep. If you're not ever dreaming, you know, you would, you would, you probably want to think about, um, how deep and restful your sleep actually is. And that's what Sally's question is. Is it unusual not to dream when you do get to sleep? Yeah, it is. It should be. Um, dreaming is, is an important part uh, of your sleep cycle. And so, Although it's not unusual, Sally, it's, it's also not ideal. And so you definitely, one of the, I can tell you, one of the things that can really help with dreams, uh, if, you, if you sleep every night and you never dream, one of the things that, that works brilliantly and can improve your quality of sleep is choline plus vitamin B1. Um, choline, and vitamin B1 together produce acetylcholine, which is a primary neurotransmitter of your parasympathetic nervous system. Parasympathetic is your rest, sleep, digest, and heal or healing this neurotransmitter, this part of your, your nervous system helps you do all this, right, efficiently and well. And if you don't have adequate choline or B1, you can disrupt or reduce your acetylcholine, which can affect the way you rest, sleep, digest, and heal. But I have seen more people report dreaming, having dreams again with choline and B1. So if you're not dreaming at all, you might just consider that combination. Okay, what else we got here? Having fibro cramps at night, um, feet and calves, what amount of magnesium? So Karen, um, it's different for different people. I'd probably start with somewhere in the neighborhood of at, at night taking anywhere from three to 400 milligrams of magnesium before bed, but I would mix it with you know, two to one, so about, you know, if you're gonna do 300 milligrams of, of magnesium, for example, take 600 milligrams of calcium, um, especially if you're cramping at night, because a lot of times it's the combination of calcium and magnesium and not just one or the other. Do you have a recommendation for an environmental allergy test that can be taken if my Marcon test came back negative, yet my histamine and cortisol are at high levels? Could it be due to having COVID three months prior? No. Um, if you had COVID three months ago, you shouldn't have high histamine today or high cortisol. Um, what we see, I'm going to just say this, what we see in long COVID, so a lot of people out there struggling with what's being called the long, we'll just call it the long bug, okay? Um, I've seen a couple dozen cases of the long bug, and in every case, those individuals we're in mold. And why is that the case? Because when you get sick, what do you do? When you get sick, you stay home. If your home is moldy and you have a mold problem, now maybe before you were sick, you were out, you were shopping, you were outside, you were doing things, but now you're staying home. So now your level of mold exposure increases, right? And you're trying to recover from a bug and with a lot of people that got it bad, okay, what happens when you get it bad is your body, your immune system ramps up. What does it do? It takes protein from your muscle. This is why a lot of people lost weight when they were sick, right? It takes the protein from your muscle to help you produce antibodies to go after this bad guy and win that war. But when the war is over, your protein, you've, you've tapped into all your reserve, especially if you weren't in good shape or athletic before, and you've now, you become atrophied, your muscles have atrophied and you have no more reserve. And so what happens is your hair starts falling out, you become protein malnourished, 
right? You, you remember a lot of the proteins help us sleep properly, right? So many of the neurotransmitters are protein derivative. What, what do we need? We need tyrosine, we need tryptophan. Um, these are the backbone amino acids that come from protein that help us produce the neurotransmitters that aid us in falling asleep at night. So our sleep becomes disrupted. But if we, again, in, if we're in mold, what does mold do? Mold basically damage, well, we could draw a whole thing here. Mold damages the kidney. And so it, it reduces, which reduces nitrogen retention, which is, what is nitrogen? Nitrogen is protein. So it reduces your protein. Your kidney's damaged because of the mold. Your immune system is already shot because you were fighting. And remember what I said earlier is this is one of the causes of elevations in histamine. So now you're not sleeping. You're still staying at home. And so your sleep is junk. Your immune system is tanked. You're not getting out of the mold. And the longer you stay in it, the sicker you feel and the sicker you get. And you're in a lot of, again, a lot of people are calling that long COVID. It's an environmental shift. And, you know, in a hundred percent of the cases that I've seen, have been mold. I haven't seen a case yet of the long haul where mold wasn't playing a major role in contributing to that person's inability to fully recover. And if you're three months in, six months in, and you aren't recovering, you know, you need to get mold checked out in much more greater detail. Do I recommend technology like Aura to help measure quality of sleep? You can, you can use it. Some people like to, to use a lot of the devices for biohacking and, and you certainly can, but let's say that you use the ring and your quality of sleep is poor. Um, it doesn't necessarily help you any, right? You want actionable things that you can do. What some people do is they make different changes in their sleep hygiene or you know in their day and then they track their sleep to see if it's improving. But I have a little less faith in a lot of these personal wearable devices simply because you know when you had a good night's sleep. You don't need a ring to tell you whether or not you've had a good night's sleep. When you wake up feeling refreshed and you have good energy, you know, no ring or, or device, you know, wh whatever it may be, is gonna be helping you understand that it was better or worse without giving you some type of psychological ill effects. Let's see here. What cause? I think I answered that one. Eating blueberries, I dream again. Thanks for sharing. So Susan says that eating blueberries, she's starting to dream. Uh, let's see. Back it up just a little bit. Oh, I think I answered that one. Oh, wait, here we go, part two to it. I dream every night in color and usually remember them well. However, I do wake several times per night to urinate with an overactive bladder. So a couple of things that will wake you up. That's good. Uh, a lot of people wake up at night, not because they're waking up because they couldn't sleep, but because they have to urinate. So there are a number of different reasons. One of the reasons people have to wake up and urinate is because their blood sugar is too high. High blood sugar. Diabetes, right? And you don't have to have diabetes. You can be pre-diabetic. You know, so, so again, if, you're, if your hemoglobin A1C is 5.7 or higher, you're pre-diabetic. Uh, if it's over six, you're diabetic. And so this is a simple test you can ask your doctor to run along with some other tests like blood glucose and C-peptide and insulin. Um, but this is one reason, again, blood sugar. And so when your sugar's too high, your, your, your kidneys want to filter more. And so you'll have this excessive urination, this greater urge. Now, if you're a man, you know, it could be that you have a prostate enlargement. And there are a number of things that can cause that. In my experience, gluten is a big one. Um, I've seen cases where zinc deficiency and B12, um, you know, supplementation really, really were helpful in the, the prostate. Some also take things like saw palmetto as su prostate support supplements that have been shown to have some improvement. But um, benign prostatic hypertrophy or enlarged prostate can be a reason because it puts pressure uh, on the ureter and, and, may, and the bladder makes men need to 
wake up more frequently to go to the bathroom. And so again, catch this early because if it becomes too big, it can be really become a problem. Another thing that I see is toxic burden. Any kind of environmental or food-based toxic burden. Remember, when you have a toxic burden in your bloodstream, you're, you put pressure on the kidneys to filter. When you increase the kidneys workload, what you're basically going to do is the kidney's going to crank out more urine, and so you're going to have to go to the bathroom more. When I was one, of, one of, and one of the big things here is mold. Like I, I was in toxic mold, and one of the things I found with myself personally is I was waking up three times a night that I'd have to go to the bathroom, and my sleep was miserable, uh, and that was one of my clue ins as to why I was being exposed. But um, it's not, it doesn't have to just be mold, it can be other toxins as well. It can be food toxins, it can be other chemical toxins, but anything that increases the work of your kidneys, then you have to realize that, that your kidneys are gonna try to filter better for you, and so you're gonna have more urine output as a result of that increased filtration. Uh, is Sleepy Time tea with valerian okay? Well, valerian tea is fine. I would just say is the tea that you're looking at, is it organic? Because if it's not organic, I don't know that I would really recommend it. A lot of the herbal teas, if you're not getting them organically, um, you know, now you run the risk of pesticides and other chemicals. Let's see here. Scroll down on that right just a little bit more. During, so Monica wants to know, during the beginning of perimenopause, can you start having um, swollen, puffy, achy hands, which may be menopausal arthritis? No such thing as menopausal arthritis. Somebody told you a line, hook line on that. Um, if you've got swollen, puffy hands and feet uh, and arthritic pain, you've got something that is irritating your body you need to get it checked out, Monica. I'd recommend working with somebody who understands functional nutrition. Um, Shai is asking about EMFs affecting mold. Yeah, EMFs in, enhance mold growth. There have been a number of studies that show that uh, the, if, you've live in, if you've got mold in your environment and you have a lot of EMF in your environment, EMFs actually enhance how well mold can grow. So EMFs, not good. So a lot, a lot of times that puffiness, I'll just come back to that a little bit, the puffiness, the swelling, this is B6, or it can be. B6 is a natural diuretic. It helps also in the production of progesterone. In a lot of women going into perimenopause, there, there's a shift in estrogen and progesterone, and some of them become a little bit more estrogen dominant, and that's where that can come from. So some women find B6 very helpful as well. Uh, what do I suggest to help regain the smelling ability? Um, a little more time, but, but if you're trying supplementally to try to improve, zinc and quercetin, just at higher doses. So I'd say, you know, with zinc, upwards of 100, 125 milligrams of quercetin or uh, of zinc, and then, you know, anywhere between one and three grams a day of quercetin, um, along with uh, breathing, essential oil breathing, to help, um, to help stimulate the olfactory nerves. And, and some people I've seen also do well in that regard with the loss of smell with, um, with alpha lipoic acid. Yeah, so I wake up thirsty with hot flashes. If I drink, I pee all night. If I don't, I can't sleep. Now I gain four pounds because I don't sleep. Um, you got a deeper problem, most likely, Nancy, and so that you really probably ought to follow up with somebody and get kind of a, a deeper biochemical work I've done uh, because, you know, that's a catch-22, right? Thirsty, you need to drink. You can't drink because you pee. You can't, you can't sleep either way. You got to get it figured out because if you're not sleeping, um, you're going to have a problem. Stacy asked, I'm always told that calcium is not a good supplement to take because it can build up in your arteries. No, I mean, it can, but generally calcium doesn't build up in your arteries. Calcium just doesn't say, hey, the artery is my favorite place to hang out. Where, where calcium ends up in your arteries if you have infl inflamed blood vessels. So if you're eating poorly, 
um, a, a, you know, sugar hydrogenated oils, if you're gluten sensitive and, and your blood vessels are inflamed, your body will deposit calcium in those patches of inflammation in an effort to try to basically patch over that blood vessel, but that's not because you're just using calcium in general. Calcium deposits in arterial linings or walls are not as a result of taking calcium supplements unless you have some major pituitary gland problems or, or um, parathyroid gland problems. That, that, shouldn't, you know, that, that shouldn't happen just in general from taking calcium supplementation. If magnesium is good for sleep, how much can you safely take with stage three kidney disease? I mean, you should be fine. You always ask your nephrologist, but um, you know, you know, if you're talking about a little bit of magnesium before bed, two, 300 milligrams should be perfectly fine, even if you have stage three. Um, I think the bigger question there, Barb, is why do you have stage three kidney disease? What is it that you're doing that's contributing to your kidneys not working and failing? Um, you know, because I've seen stage three and stage four reverse with diet change in people. And so again, going back to why, why is that the case? That's a, to me a more important question. Um, let's see here, is vitamin K required with vitamin D? No, um, but you can take them together. It's certainly not, not a bad thing. A lot of people talk, have been talking about how if you don't take vitamin K and vitamin D together, then you'll cause calcium buildup in the arteries because vitamin K helps calcium make it where it's supposed to go, which is in your bone and as an electrolyte. But that's not 100% true. I mean, I, I've, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan more of the test than I am of the guess. And so I, I've seen more than 10,000 people with vitamin D deficiency uh, and probably more than half of those individuals, I didn't use vitamin K and they were just fine and they corrected their vitamin D deficiency and they went on to become healthier and do better without vitamin K. So it's not a requirement. I think if you don't run testing to see whether or not you're low or not, it's not a bad idea to take them together. But if you're running tests and you're, let's say you're not deficient in vitamin K, but you are deficient in vitamin D, then you don't necessarily need to take extra K with the D. Okay. And we go down a little on the right. A little bit more. Okay, there it is. So, but how would we stop our blood sugar from dropping while we sleep? One of the best ways to get good, stable blood sugar is to make sure that you're not deficient in the micronutrients that regulate it. So going back to what I said earlier, magnesium, chromium, zinc, or bar none, super critical and important for regulating blood sugar. A lot of people with, with those deficiencies and vitamin D as well, um, well, they don't regulate their blood sugar very well because of those deficiencies. So again, a good place to start would be looking and measuring for those deficits. Outside of that, looking at your diet. Um, some people's diets are poor and so their blood sugar is elevated on average because they have poor diets and they have low muscle tone. You need good muscles to maintain blood sugar, but you also need a good diet. And, and, and that can be different for different people. I mean, I've seen cases where some people ate, you know, what would be considered a low sugar, low glucose, low glycemic food, and it spikes their blood sugar. Everybody's a little different in that regard. Good food source of zinc, um, any meat. Any meat is a good source of zinc. Zinc comes in, in a lot of different meats and nuts as well. Yeah, so somebody, somebody mentioned that, um, let's see here. 
acid reflux led to confirmed diagnosis of celiac disease, took myself off of protonics and started on a probiotic yogurt, very little acid reflux ever since. I like hearing that, that, that makes perfect sense. Um, a lot of times, member gluten can disrupt the microbiome and it can be a cause of, of acid reflux. And, uh, and probiotics can be very, very helpful. There are a number of studies that have shown that the right, you know, the right types of bifidobacteria and lactobacillus can be very helpful at, at reducing the symptoms of acid reflux in people with gluten sensitivity. Supplements that help with mold. Deborah, the number one thing you can do if you've got a mold problem is get out of the mold. Um, all the supplements in the world won't fix the poisoning. It's kind of like, you know, if mold is your problem and you don't get out of it, you can take vitamins, you can take minerals, you can take binders, but you're just spinning your wheels and you're spending a lot of money on supplements that are probably not gonna have a very good outcome for you. I do have supplements that help with mold, that being said, but again, before you used any of them, I would highly suggest getting out of the mold if you're not already. Um, one of the things we use is a binder called uh, Mycobinder. Mycobinder Plus, and it's um, a mixture of different things like zeolite and charcoal and fulvic acid. It can be very, very helpful as a binding agent. And we also use other things for mold. Some of the most helpful things be like alpha lipoic acid, um, as well as vitamin C. Uh, very, very helpful if you're trying to recover from, from mold exposure, from chronic you know, mold exposure. Uh, and a number of other things, but I would really suggest if you're struggling in that arena to really follow up with somebody who knows how to guide you. Is too much B6 toxic? In very, 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 look, I've been practicing 21 years, Amelie, and I've seen one case of B6 toxicity, one. And I've used high doses of B6 in thousands and thousands of people. So can it be toxic? Yes. Is it common? Extremely uncommon. Let's see. How much chromium needed per day? If you're trying to control your blood sugar, you know, it depends on your height and weight and everything else. But a good place to start is, is two, anywhere between two and, and 600 micrograms a day is a, is a decent place to, to begin the process there. How do you know if you have mold? You get tested. Karen, and there's different ways to get tested, but you first and foremost test yourself because if you have somebody like a mold inspector come out, a lot of times they're lazy, they don't know what the hell they're doing. Uh, you know, you need a weekend seminar to get a mold inspector license. Um, and so a lot of these folks are, you know, the blind leading the blind. Uh, and you don't want to spend a bunch of hundreds of dollars having a mold inspection done and get a false negative uh, or false sense of security about whether or not you have an issue. This is working with a doctor that can test you directly for mold. And that, and that you know, there's, there's a lot of different tests for mold. Um, and most of them, you know, a lot, a lot of doctors will run a battery of tests where you're looking at, you know, um, MSH. Uh, there's another one called transforming growth factor beta one and there, there's other ones like mmp there and and so these tests are being used by a lot of doctors as you have mold but that's not what these tests mean these tests don't mean if they're positive right these tests don't mean you have mold these tests mean that you have chronic inflammation there's a lot of things that cause chronic inflammation a lot of things and it's not that these tests can't be helpful, but in the reality is, is they're not specific to mold. And so maybe that those tests are elevated because you have chronic inflammation because you're not gluten free or because you're allergic to dairy or because you're reacting to sugar or because you're reacting to some other uh, umpteen different foods that you might be eating that are driving the inflammatory process. So these, again, when it comes to mold, you don't ever want to run tests that are nonspecific because they require a degree of guesswork. And when it comes to mold, you know what the reality of mold is, if you got mold in your house that's poisoning you and killing you slowly, 
you need to understand exactly whether or not it's mold. If you run a bunch of non-specific tests, you don't know exact. You don't know whether mold is part of your problem or not. You speculate. It's a hell of a hard decision to make whether you should leave your house or stay in your house based on speculative testing. So you gotta get super accurate and run the right kinds of tests that are specific for whether you're in mold. And, and the, one of the best is to run, ask your doctor or to run a test that measures mycotoxins. Mycotoxins, because if you're overloaded with mycotoxins, specific ones in particular, um, you've got a mold problem. If you're not, you, you probably don't have a mold problem. And so, but it's important to work with a doctor if you're gonna do this, who understands mycotoxins, understands um, provocation of mycotoxins, under, understands which types of tests to look at here, which ones actually to run, because there are different types of mycotoxins that can be measured. And so, you know, again, working with somebody who knows what the hell they're talking about, in my opinion, is the most important thing to do and to, to get to a point where you're not speculating about maybe it is or maybe it isn't. Okay. And that's, that's another one that doesn't, it's not a mark on, this is another one. So mark ons is not a mold test. Marcon's, what that, those of you who may or may not know, Marcon stands for multi antibiotic resistant coagulase negative staph. That's why we just abbreviate it and say Marcon's. But it's a specific nasal swab that measures a type of staphylococcus that can inhabit your sinus cavities, which is a common type of staph that some people have if they're immunosuppressed. Now, mold isn't, it can cause immunosuppression, but it isn't the only thing that can cause immunosuppression. So when you have a positive mark on, it doesn't mean you're in mold. It's speculative, at best speculative, because a lot of people have coagulase negative staph in their sinus cavities, but are not in moldy environments. And so again, you can't use that test to justify, do I need to move out of my house? Do I need to pay thousands of dollars for mold remediation? I can't emphasize that enough, when, especially because mold is a major problem. I mean, mold is, in my opinion, um, you know, I go back in time 21 years ago when I first started practice and nobody had ever heard the term gluten sensitivity. And, you know, here, uh, not just myself, but myself and a, a small handful of other doctors across the world were really the ones that brought the attention to this area. And today, it's a household item. It's a household word. Everybody across the country, everybody in the world, for the most part, in industrialized countries, knows what gluten and gluten-free means. Even if their definitions are wrong, they still have heard the word. This is where we're going to be in the next 10 to 15 years with mold. We have terrible infrastructure. Um, we, have, we have basically an entire building industry, an entire industry has failed us in building homes that are safe and that keep uh, moisture out and that keep mold from growing. And so we have a huge infrastructure problem of homes where mold is growing and it has grown in them and is slowly just killing people over time. And we're gonna see more and more about this. Mark my words, I'm predicting the future. Um, in, in the next five to 10 years, you're gonna see and hear a lot more about toxic mold because it is a major, major health issue for many of you and you don't even know it yet. Okay. I did a cleanse protocol with food restricted to Ayurvedic herbs and whole grains for 10 days. My joint pain returned almost at once. I mean, if you were cleansing with whole grains, you, you probably did return. No grain, no pain. Um, go read it. It's very common for it to cause joint pain. And so if your cleanse was based on eating whole grains, it doesn't surprise me to see that your joint pain returned to you. And no, South Asian populations cannot tolerate grain, in my experience, better than others. I see just as many South Asian people have gluten sensitivity issues as I do Irish and English and Americans, etc. Okay, I think we're out of time. Yeah, I'm 22 minutes over. I'm hungry. I'm going to go home and eat. Hopefully, you're already at home and you can eat, eat something healthy and get a good night's sleep. 
And uh, hey, look, come visit me at glutenfreesociety.org, especially if you want to get the show notes. The show notes are there. If you come over and visit, you can access them along with all the images and all the articles. Make sure you sign up for our newsletter. Uh, we won't spam you with a bunch of junk. We'll just give you great, solid information. Remember, our goal here is to save 100 million lives. So if you found tonight's show helpful, please help us share this show with five other friends, 10 other friends. Let's get the word out that, that life change and diet change are the crux of good health and that you cannot have good health without those things. And together, we can help save 100 million lives. Have a fantastic week. We'll see you next Monday. Take care. Hey, don't forget to tune in next week, same time, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time for another Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain Show. Bring all your toughest health questions to me. I look forward to answering them. And before you leave today, make sure you hit subscribe. And once you do, click that bell. That bell is gonna allow us to remind you right before we go live, but it's also gonna allow us to remind you when we come out with other video content all week long. We've got lots of episodes coming your way all week long and I don't want you to miss anything. So again, subscribe, hit that bell so that you can get notified when we have that new information put up for you. Thanks so much and I'm wishing you excellent health. Have a great week. We'll see you next Monday night.